Welcome everybody to our third episode already um, of GLC face to face, a very short coffee break on digital learning. Um, my name is Christian. I'm working for the DAD, uh, for the DAD, I'm saying already, uh, for the GLC um, head office. Um, the Global Learning Council, GLC, is a think tank of thought leaders on digital learning. And this coffee break is a format that we are doing, as I said, in the third episode already, um, every two weeks. Um, as a coffee break with two um, panelists um, who talk about digital learning. This episode right now is called What's Next? Um, uh, digital learning in times of crisis. And we are talking today about the um, international dimension in the current pandemic situation, and how it impacts on digital learning. Um, what we will do right now is about 20 minutes of panel discussions with our two guests and afterwards um, we will dedicate the rest uh, of the 10 minutes um, for your questions. Um, to put those questions, please use the Q&A &Q tool. You will find that in the toolbar um, down below. Q&A, please um, address your question through that tool. You can also use the chat, of course, to exchange ideas um, among the attendees. Um, so very welcome. Um, welcome also to both of the panelists um, of today's episode. Um, Jaibarata Mukherjee, um, welcome to the call. Um, you are president both of the University of Gießen in Germany and of the DAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, as I learned, one of the largest, no, the largest um, student exchange service in the world. Um, welcome, Professor Mukherjee. Oh, Thanks for having invited me. And Supra Suresh, um, president of the Nanyang Technological University, one of the most innovative universities, young universities in the world, um, from Singapore, and also the founding chairperson of this very network. Um, welcome, Supra. Thank you. Um, so my first question um, to both of you um, is, how is your organization doing at the moment? Um, how is the situation in Singapore and how is Nanyang Technological University coping with a crisis situation, Supra? Sure. Uh, Singapore being a very small city state, uh, it's very easy to, uh, not easy, but it's easier compared to much larger uh, countries to mobilize. And also it's uh, uh, the, the industry, university, academ academia collaboration in Singapore. Uh, has always been very strong. And given all of this in the last, uh, uh, since the crisis started and Singapore was one of the first countries where the, the initial cases started with the tourists from China to, to Singapore, uh, it managed very well for many months until about early April or so. We had everything open, including the university. We had some measures in place, such as no more than 50% gatherings and so forth at that time. Then in early April, we had to tighten because there was one particular cluster where there were more cases that were starting to emerge. And as a result of this, Singapore government instituted something called uh, a circuit breaker. So that's been in effect since early January, which is supposed to last until the 1st of June. So at NTU, what we have done is uh, we have um, uh, 33,000 students uh, we immediately, within a few days, switched to online. We had 650 courses online. And uh, we could migrate because we had already prepared over the last many years to do these kinds of things, uh, online education. So it was relatively easier for us to switch. On top of it, we conducted our first ever virtual open house for job fair for students, a virtual career fair, open house for uh, admitting new students, and we realized that technology has worked much better than we thought it would work uh, for, for virtual meetings and large gatherings, et cetera. In fact, we had an administrative town hall two weeks ago where more than 2,200 of our staff joined in without any problems. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it was easy. So we had to do all kinds, take all kinds of measures. Since early February, every member of our community logs in their temperature and physical condition twice a day on a university-based website voluntarily with no personal information disclosed. And uh, so that has been in effect. We've had thermal cameras, temperature taking, uh, that's been going on for three and a half months. 
and uh, travel has been severely curtailed. So this is something that we expect will continue in the new model. But let me just leave with uh, two uh, le le lessons learned from this in the last uh, month and a half. One is, as I said, technology has surpri surprisingly worked much better than we thought, even though nothing can replace human face-to-face -face contact and interaction. This is the next best thing. The second thing we learned is at a time of um, increasingly globalized world, the world has been forced to become more and more local because of the pandemic. It's become more parochial, more localized, and more nationalistic. And the future is going to be, how do we manage the tension between the two? So let me stop there for now. Thank you so much. Um, Gibraltar, how is the situation at DAD? How is DAD coping with the crisis? Well, we as DAD um, are the largest um, funding agency worldwide for international collaboration and scholarships for international mobility. And uh, so the situation at DAD headquarters is twofold. For us as an institution, we have actually never been in a real shutdown situation because we send all of our staff members into home office um, scenarios. And we were well prepared for that because of the investment we uh, undertook over the past few years into our digital infrastructures. And we had to take care of thousands of scholarship holders in Germany and worldwide, as you can easily imagine. And we could take very good care of um, all these scholarship holders from home office situations. But we see that we are currently in a transformation phase because new work scenarios um, will become more standard in the future. Uh, there is a no new home office culture. So that's, um, that's the DAD as an institution with over 1000 staff here at Bonn headquarters and worldwide. On the other hand, we had to take care of all the projects and scholarships for which we are the funding agency. And of course, what we now did um, in collaboration with our funding uh, ministries, we get the um, funding budget from various ministries and political authorities. They gave us generously, they gave us a lot of flexibility uh, in reallocating the money for digital formats. So in various projects that we fund, take the European universities, for example, uh, that were newly created last year. In these formats, what we now do is reallocate the money for digital formats, because for the time being and until further notice, we know that physical mobility will be very difficult. So we have to find alternative ways, digital ways, virtual scenarios for retaining the close collaboration between institutions and also between uh, individual research partners and also between students. Can we talk a bit more about that aspect? Um, you both mentioned the, new, the, the, the challenges for international cooperation at the moment. Uh, are we facing a situation where also no new tools for international cooperation will come up that maybe last longer than just the crisis that we are experiencing at the moment? I think um, uh, given the experience of many companies, uh, for-profit industries, as well as non-profit academic institutions like universities, for example, uh, there is a realization now that we can work differently, effectively, in a way that optimizes our benefits and minimizes our drawbacks. So it may not be completely virtual in the future, and it won't be completely in-person either, based on the uh, realization that we've had in the last few months. So for example, uh, a company like Morgan Stanley, with hundreds of thousands of employees all over the world, 90% of their employees have worked from home without causing significant uh, difference mm -hmm. or effect. And the effect on climate change, the effect on uh, traffic, the, the stress levels that are induced. Um, so there are pros and cons in a highly uh, crowded big cities, whether it's New York City or Singapore or Frankfurt, etc. people living in small apartments in downtown uh, working from home may not be that convenient when you have children running around at home at the same time. 
But on the other hand, for some others, it may be a convenient way to do. So I think going back, there are a few things that I think we will reflect on and hopefully change in a very measured way, very carefully in the future. So here is a few things that come to here are a few things that come to mind. I think we'll have a different balance of online versus in-person education and interactions at steady state, whatever the new normal may be. Telecommuting and staggering of work hours for all employees and dividing the employee base into different groups so that not everybody has to be there. And that may lead to other questions. If we have only at any given time, half of our employees in the building, do we really need 100% of the space for all employees all the time? <laughs> How does it change the space requirements and financial considerations and things like this? Different ways of credentializing, credentialing, subsidizing, and monetizing educational content and lifelong learning in the context of education. We launched at NTU something called a mini master's certificate program during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, th this is something new and our faculty and students uh, and, and staff came up with this. We may have a different way of thinking about what career preparedness means in the future and what impact means in the long term in the post COVID world. Um, we have many more people who have severe financial distress today, students, and even some of the staff members that we did not realize before. So we have put in place uh, immediate measures to help them, interest-free loans that they will pay back after some years after getting jobs, things like this. We had to put in place very quickly. And lastly, the destinations where large numbers of students, especially from Asia, went to, such as North America or the UK, there are two obstacles now started by COVID. One is many middle-income families don't have the resources to pay very high tuition in private universities, especially in North America. Secondly, many of the reasons the students went was because they could get a job to make up for the investment. With 33 million Americans unemployed already, that possibility may disappear, at least in the foreseeable future. So what does it mean for institutions that attracted students from around the world because of these attractive factors which may not exist in the next two to three years. I think these are going to be different, different ways of thinking, both for the customers and for the providers. Thank you. Um, Joe Brato, what do you think? Is there a window well, of opportunity for new formats? Well, there are, there are a number of things that I couldn't agree more with. Actually, everything that Subra just mentioned also applies by and large uh, to the German context. Um, and I would like to to perhaps add three aspects that we need to tackle over the next uh, weeks and months to prepare ourselves for a post-corona um, world, which will definitely be different from the world uh, we were used to until say January, February, 2020. So one, I do think that, that what the COVID-19 pandemic uh, fosters, um, accelerates is, is a discussion that we already had last year um, and the years before in, because of the carbon footprint of international mobility, um, also fostered by international uh, collaboration in higher education. Um, I think we have to intellectually dissociate physical mobility from intercultural experience. Mm -hmm. And there will be a core uh, in which face-to-face -face contacts will be vital and continue to be vital but there will be many, many more contexts, adjacent contexts in which we will wish to replace or to add digital contexts, virtual scenarios to that very face-to-face -face core. And I think uh, the pandemic is now a catalyst for the discussion we already started to, to have over the past months and, and years. That will also lead to a new landscape, a new portfolio of funding mechanisms for an institution like DAD, but probably also for many other funding agencies worldwide in other countries. For example, we are currently thinking about digital scholarships. So scholarships not for physical mobilities of students and researchers, but scholarships for people who gain intercultural experience, who collaborate with other partners worldwide without physically moving to another country. 
I may uh, wish to mention in this context that at the moment in this pandemic, we have an ad hoc policy of the European Commission that European students in the Erasmus Plus program get their scholarship if they just take part in online learning scenarios at other universities in other European countries, even though they don't move from their own country of destination to another country. So this is, by and large, already the starting point for a kind of digital scholarship that we have in mind. And the third thing we have to keep in mind that brings us back to the larger picture, I think, is that the post-corona world, and Subra already mentioned a few implications of the economic developments that we can uh, observe at the moment uh, in the United States and other countries, I think we will have a very different situation when it comes to the major waves and directions of mobility of students and researchers worldwide. And I think the mobilities will also depend on the way that countries, nations, regions tackle the pandemic at the moment, more or less successfully. That I think will also be a factor when it comes to the future waves and directions of mobility. Before I would like to switch to digital learning right now, um, may I um, still remind uh, all the attendees uh, of the Q&A tool? Um, so if you have questions, I'm already seeing one question there, um, but if you have questions, uh, please feel free um, to put them in the Q&A tool. Um, you both mentioned collaboration dimensions. From an organizational perspective, what are your partners doing right now? How do you collaborate with your partner institutions, both at NTU and DAAD, and um, especially with uh, respect to digital learning. Do you see new forms of collaboration? For example, shared teaching material, um, shared course infrastructure, um, shared curricular design, aspects like that? So we, we've been looking at uh, models of this. We have not uh, yet finalized uh, any specific uh, changes to our existing collaboration with any one partner because uh, the, the way the COVID-19 situation evolved in different parts of the world has been over different time frames. So it's a little bit out of sync. Uh, and also the academic calendars have been out of sync. So we, but we've been planning for what we would do in the fall. For example, we have optimistic scenario and pessimistic scenarios. Um, in, in one scenario, we'll have our uh, students come back as originally planned. In another scenario, if the situation, if there is a second wave or a third wave of cases that evolve, then we may think about online learning with some partners in the region. So NTU students who may be in different parts of the world may partner, we may partner with some of our existing collaborators uh, so that we have online material that's available. And how we collaborate with different partners could be different depending on where they are located and how long we've had that collaboration. So it's on a case by case basis for now. But one of the things we have done, for example, uh, this has reinforced the strong partnership we have in Singapore between various government agencies and the university, for example, just uh, 10 days ago, we announced that we will provide 600 new traineeships of our, for our students who will be graduating this year who may have difficulty finding jobs. So the government of Singapore will provide 80% of the salary for up to one year for these students until they find a job. And we will accommodate many of them, several hundred of them within the universities in our corporate labs, jointly with our industry partners, but also in our research labs and centers and institutes within the campus. And other universities in Singapore have done similar things. So those are examples of different ways in which we can, we can connect. So, but what about your partners at DAAD and also for the universities maybe? Yeah, I mean, these are the two levels at which we address uh, the question of how to collaborate. For us as DAAD, as a funding agency, as a funding organization, um, as a think tank also on issues of higher education policy, it's not so much of a problem because we have switched our collaboration uh, into web webinar formats, into virtual formats. We discuss, we discuss current issues of higher education policy 
in Germany, in Europe and worldwide with our organizations using virtual and digital formats. That's not so much of a problem. But we are, as you know, um, an organization whose members are the universities in Germany and their student bodies. And we see, of course, that everyone tries to tackle this very unusual situation. We have started four weeks ago, we started into a fully digital summer semester in Germany at German universities. Um, everything is done in virtual formats. And of course, uh, what we try as DAD is bring together the experts, the students and the researchers from all the universities to find uh, solutions from the day-to-day -day problems that we have to tackle at the moment. So for example, we um, conducted a countrywide hackathon with 1,000 students um, two weeks ago to bring together students, you know, and their problems, their solutions, so that solutions can be found for the same uh, problems arising out of digital learning scenarios. Um, and I think this is something we should do as DAD, together also with other funding agencies, bring the expertise from all the universities, from the researchers, the instructors, the students uh, together. Um, and I do think, if I may add that, at the moment we see a lot of grassroots activities, a lot of um, innovation and creativity. But at some point, of course, we need to address the issues of quality, uh, and also the question of standardization and um, scalability, because what works now for this seminar here and that lecture there has to be standardized in one way or the other in a new digital scenario of the post-corona world. It's nice, I see my colleague Anne just joined us uh, with questions from the audience. Hi everyone. Um, I collected a few things. Um, I have two questions for each of you. Uh, let me start maybe with one for Supra. Um, there was a question, were there moments when you felt things even work better online? Yeah, so um, th there was one example I, I actually mentioned to my colleagues. Uh, um, so we had a meeting about uh, four weeks ago with the entire senior leadership team of the university. There were about 45 people on a Zoom call and we had a two hour meeting with PowerPoint presentations and so forth. And I made a comment at the end of the meeting and I realized that I could actually see each one of them on the screen, especially <laughs> when they were talking. And uh, I could see their facial expressions and uh, it was a real two-way interaction when I was communicating with an individual in a group of about uh, um, 45, 45 people or so, which would have been very hard to do in a very large conference room and somebody is sitting at the other end of the room. So there are some advantages to technology and I'm just getting a new computer next week, which will have a 4K screen. So I think it'll be even better if, uh, if that works out well. Um, great. And uh, there was also a question that just popped up just now to Dobrato. Could you describe such new digital learning scenarios that you were mentioning? Well, there are a lot of digital learning scenarios that the instructors and the students in the various study programs use at the moment. Um, and of course, it's a matter of playing by ear, uh, but also of trying out things that have been tried out in other study programs, in other contexts. For example, I'm fascinated by the way that our, um, at my own university in Gießen, um, our own um, professors and instructors in chemistry, how they try to make their students get involved in digital scenarios in experiments, in chemical experiments in the lab. No one is present, the students are in home office, but it's all prepared in a way that the fundamental chemical mechanisms can be um, explored through digital formats. So this is one example of many, many examples uh, where we can see at the moment a lot of creativity um, in the various study programs um, that German universities offer. Mm -hmm. um, there was another question that came in earlier about the aspects of the new working from home culture that you might uh, like to see 
exist after the call after the crisis also maybe just as a follow-up to that um, you also see that there are some some benefits there so uh, you know uh, i i hope that uh, after is more than two months where the entire world has been in some form of uh, massive change we have some lessons learned and we don't go back to the old old but we have something new that we can all adapt and uh, all of us have seen nasa's photos from space of how different cities including venice and new delhi looked before the covid and after the covid without traffic on a personal level all of us realized that we don't necessarily have to get on a on a plane every other week uh, to and and the benefits of not getting on a plane every other week uh, both from a health perspective but also from a financial perspective carbon footprint perspective uh, climate change perspective etc uh, the third question is uh, i serve on the board of a large multinational company and they we've been talking about it uh, at our board meetings you know do we really need so many locations, so many offices, especially in uh, expensive real estate locations in different parts of the world, uh, in pretty much every major city in the world, can we work from home? And the, initially everybody said, no, you cannot do that. Now the same people are realizing that, uh, um, uh, of course it's possible, we've done it for two months uh, uh, successfully. And the last thing I, I would say that even in academia, there were a lot of skeptics among our colleagues who said, oh, digital learning will never may make it because uh, it's not the same as face-to-face. -face. And even some of them uh, are realizing that maybe there is some truth to adopting digital learning, even though it cannot completely replace face-to-face -face engagement. And, the, and I will just close by making one other point. I think the human adaptability is quite profound and impressive. And the way the entire world has adapted to this, uh, this shock, uh, uh, overwhelming shock. And I think, uh, I believe in human ingenuity and I think uh, we will continue to innovate as, a, as we come out of the crisis. That's a really nice, nice way of looking at it. I have um, just one final question. Um, with, um, so with Singapore being an international community, but also with the DAD sort of basing itself on the international collaboration, is there, um, are you seeing also a shift maybe in teaching toward also a more national focus as in now borders are closed now people are looking inward is there something like focusing on national problems and needs and skills or is this international globalized perspective still persevering beyond the, the borders that are closed yeah I think from a Singapore's perspective it's a very small country it's smaller than the smallest state in the US which is Rhode Island where I lived for 10 years. And uh, so every flight out of Singapore is an international flight. And things like rising sea levels, global change, tsunamis, hurricanes, you cannot control within your borders. It comes from somewhere else, including forest fires, et cetera. So ultimately, all the global challenges that you address in research at the university, et cetera, has to be different. And we have 33,000 students at the undergraduate level, um, more than, little more than 10% of our students are international students. At the postgraduate level, uh, almost uh, more, more than half our students are international students. Uh, somewhere between 60% and two thirds of our faculty are international. Because we, Singapore has always attracted top talent from all over the world. I very much doubt that that will change. Uh, and, and be given that Singapore primarily relies on interactions with the external world, it cannot focus internally, uh, even though the crisis has put focus on things we can do internally, it cannot be, a, it, it is not a long-term focus. It cannot be because of the financial imperatives that we have. Right. So as a result of this, um, the problem is going to be when other countries and other borders close, how do you engage with them? when you are intrinsically an export-based economy and tourist-based economy. And we need tourists to come in here for the economy to, to, be, to thrive. If tourists don't come, it hurts Singaporean economy. So I think that's, uh, and wealth management, banking, uh, it's the second largest seaport in the world and one of the largest and best airports in the world. So you cannot shut them down forever. 
So how do you keep them open is going to be critical. Thank you. Tabata? <laughs> yeah, well, the same, I think the same situation holds true for, for Germany, although Germany is, of course, much bigger, has a um, larger population. But the international orientation of German higher education and of the German society at large will not change because of the pandemic. Um, and also, we are embedded in Europe. We are the largest member state of the European Union. There is this shared, uh, there is the shared Schengen area. Of course, national borders have gone up over the past few weeks, but there is a very hot debate about how um, the borders can, can be opened again between the European nations. So there will always be a European and a global perspective in the higher education uh, through the pandemic situation and afterwards. So this won't change, but there will be a new appreciation of face-to-face -face formats and physical mobility where it cannot be replaced. And there will be a new appreciation of digital formats where they prove to work fairly well. I think there will be a new balance between the physical and the non-physical, the real and the virtual. Okay. So a nice closing remark. Thank you for that. Um, because we are already at the end of this episode. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Jay Brato. Thank you, Supra, for joining us for this episode. Thank you all for diving in. Please join us again in two weeks um, for our next episode. You can already register. Uh, you will find the link um, in the chat here. Um, already it's on June 2nd um, at 3 p.m. Um, this time um, on a discussion on business models in times of crisis with uh, Andy Rosen from Kaplan and Renata Zuta from Chiron. Um, so thank you all for attending and see you in two weeks. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.